Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, welcome to what I think is going to be the first of a lot of discussions around this new world we're facing. Uh, thank you for joining me. I'm going to be doing these weekly. This first one is going to be an overview, really, of how we are seeing the corona economy and what it means for business owners. But before I start, I think it's a very, very apt picture, which is all around. Yep, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And that was said by Mike Tyson. And I don't know if any of you have ever been punched in the face before. Uh, I've been doing martial arts for years and getting punched in the face shatters all the ideas you had about your opponent, what you were going to do, how you planned the fight. It is quite something. The part that he left out is, and I would add to his quote, I would say, yes, everyone has a plan till they get punched in the mouth, but it's the winners who always get up. And that's what we're going to be talking about. So surviving the Corona economy, it's a business owner's guide. Uh, the intention and introduction I've shared with you, uh, I really hope to make this a resource for uh, entrepreneurs, business owners, private business owners, especially, especially people who have self-funded their businesses, which is by far most of us. Um, it will vary in terms of its content, depending on whether you are part of the good, bad and ugly. I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, and I just want to give some very quick cred credits over here. The ideas I'll be sharing with you didn't come from the ether. Uh, very, very briefly, uh, when we started Auric, we did so for the first nine years by starting, building, and selling 12 businesses. Uh, two failed, two listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, and the rest all got sold through a combination of management buyouts and corporate buyouts. Um, from that, we have been very fortunate in having understood how to actually structure the growth of a business in a very, very organized manner. In South Africa, over the last 10 years, we've worked with over 2,542 businesses, uh, the largest of which does about 1.5 billion rand, and the smallest of which does probably around uh, 6, 7 million rand a year. Uh, currently, we're working with 97 SMEs in the USA and the UK. I'm in active content, uh, contact with them. Uh, I typically used to travel every quarter to go and visit them for a two-week period. That's obviously happening no longer, so it's all through Zoom sessions. And this exact Zoom session, this exact experience, is going to become the norm for many of us. You know, we've always thought we want to digitize our business, and what does it mean? Well, this is the first step. And it shows you, out of necessity, we are now going to be forced to do it, and we're going to be forced to become good at it. Because those who win will adopt it and will become good at it. And then finally, um, I work with 68 corporates in Africa through Auric. And I promise you, they're, they're not having an easy ride either. Because extensively, they've got massive SME supply chains, and they've got extensive distribution systems that rely on businesses like yours and ours. The SME environment is what keeps an economy working. So the context, a battle plan, and it needs a battle plan. And we've got to be very definitive. What does a battle plan mean, actually? Well, if you really think about it, when you're in the moment of a battle, you don't have too much time to think and ponder. You have to act. And it's very deliberate, that word battle plan, because battle means if you're not acting, you most likely are a sitting target. I think it's important just to very briefly touch on corona strategies, country corona strategies. There are two. There are two. There's flattening the curve and sharpening the curve. And I just want to talk a little bit about what it means and why it matters. Um, just bear with me one sec. Okay, let me get my spotlight on. Good, you should all be able to see the spotlight cursor. We have a sharp curve, which is this deep blue curve over here, and we have call, what we call flattening the curve. So in the beginning, so China went immediately into flattening the curve. When they realized what this was, and they realized that it had pandemic capabilities, which it now has been classified as a pandemic. 
they realized very quickly that they had to use a strategy that would prevent infection or more importantly, slow it down. And the reason they decided this is because they recognized the, the level of contagion that this virus offers would mean that their health services would simply not be able to cope. And you know, for those of you who've traveled to China, um, you might have a sense of this, but for a lot of you who might have not been there, trust me, China is an extremely fragile environment. And it's fragile in the sense that there's always a heaving, rumbling, quiet, almost waiting presence for people to rise up and revolt. And for that reason, uh, the Chinese government, as you well know, has been obsessed about growth. Their argument, which is a good argument, is that a man or a woman with a full stomach of food never throws a stone. So grow the economy, give people opportunity, get them involved in the economy, and it will quell them. <clears throat> Excuse me. The second thing that they've always said, of course, is in China, rules is rules, and we will enforce it and everybody knows it. So they were able to very, very quickly put 56 million people into a social distancing strategy that evolved into quarantine to flatten the curve and remove the notion that should they not have done it, many, many more people would have died. And that creates a lot of political instability. The US, under the definitive strong stable genius leadership of Donald Trump adopted a view that said, we're going to let this just wash through. He classified it as a flu. He kept on shrugging his shoulders at it. And the reality is it's not a flu. They've now moved to a point where their original strategy of sharpening the curve has moved to flattening the curve. The same was said in the United Kingdom. And the only country that's been absolutely honest with its citizens has been Germany, where Angela Merkel two weeks ago said, we expect 70% of Germany to get infected with the coronavirus. We're going to do our best to treat wherever possible. We think it's unavoidable. And 57 million Germans are expected to get the virus itself, the majority of which will pass through it. So two strategies. The flattening curve strategy is defined by political stability as a precept to the capacity of a healthcare service. In South Africa, as we know, we have gone for the flattening the curve. That means social distancing, travel bans, event bans, and increasingly we're moving from a social distancing position to what might look like an isolation position. We don't know yet. Hygiene is a major, major factor Everyone is talking about hand sanitizing, washing hands. We know the story. It's not isolation yet, but it means that we're going to have to ride this for longer than anticipated. I think we're going to be riding this for around six months. Um, and this was made very, very clear by our president. And encourage the elbow greeting rather, which is... <laughs> We have to find some humor in it, otherwise we'll all go stir crazy. So where does it all begin? It begins with you. It begins with you. A number of years ago, two really smart people, a chap called Kubler and another chap called Ross, obviously you can see on the screen. One was a psychologist, the other a behavioral scientist. And what they studied, they studied divorces, they studied wars, they studied the loss of loved ones, they studied the loss of a business, they studied the loss of or the impact of tragedy. They studied all these big shock events that people experience either in an individual uh, level or at a national level across the country. And they studied it with detail in order to try and understand how does the human being, that's you and me and all of us, traverse emotionally through a curve that gets us to recover from a big shock event. What they saw is that when the shock first comes, they're surprised at this. What? 
what's happening in China? No, really? When it eventually becomes apparent that this is more than just China, there's denial. Oh, it will never happen here. As I mentioned, the stable genius said, oh, it's just a flu, and he shrugged it off, terrified of the impact on the economy in an election year. Denial, disbelief, surely it can't happen over here. Still today, there are people around the world saying, surely it won't happen here. When you realize that it is happening, and it was made very clear on Sunday night that it is happening here in South Africa, a lot of people go through frustration. All of us will. Me personally, when I realized it was going to hit us and the impact of it, based on what I was seeing already in the US, the UK, and the EU, especially coming out of Germany and Italy, man, I went mad. I, I could not contain my anger. I felt so frustrated. Firstly, we've had to deal with economic policy incompetence. Secondly, we then had to deal with Eskom. And it's just like, when is it enough? How many punches in the face do we have to tolerate? Surely this is now not going to happen. We in the process of opening up a fully fledged office in the UK, driven by our clients in South Africa who are saying on a RAND cost basis, get us, get us access to dollar and pound revenues, open up markets for us over there. The RAND dollar allows us to export. We have plans, we had investments. All of it comes to a grinding halt. I was beyond angry, frustrated. I was shouting at people in traffic with my windows up. So I did it responsibly, but I was mad. I think it was last weekend only when really I hit a very, very depressive state. And for me, that lasts mostly around two, three hours. I'm not a person who wells in depression, but I hit bottom. And very quickly, I thought, well, why, what's next? We had to act. And we've been experimenting wildly over the last week and a half, two weeks, to find a new way of doing things within the context of the new reality we all find ourselves in. And guess what? We have found a path. And as you find that path, by only trying, because truth is only found in action, whatever it is you're going to try, do it, read it, see if it works. If it does, do more of it. If it doesn't, change quickly. Don't dwell on it and don't be attached to it. You must only double down on what you see is working. It will differ for everyone and every business. And then from there, we made decisions and now we've already integrated into our new way of work. All of us are going to go through this curve. And the fact of the matter, is that we might go through it two or three times in the next six weeks. What's important over here are two things. Number one, recognize where you are in this curve. But equally importantly, recognize that everyone else you're talking to is somewhere on this curve. That's called empathy. And empathy comes from knowledge. And adopting this understanding means that when you speak to your staff, your business partner, your friends, your families, your customers, your suppliers, each of them will be at a different space in this curve. And if you don't speak to them with empathy, you won't get the result you seek. For if I talk to you about building a long-term asset in a business, and all you are about is making money in the moment, can you see we would never reach each other? We would never find a common way of seeing and hearing and understanding each other. It's kind of like, Human Communication Basics 101. Think about it. I'm going to make this all available, incidentally, to everyone afterwards. So how do we accelerate through the curve? Because let's be honest, in a crisis, when bullets are flying and punches are flying, you don't have time to sit and dwell in any of those areas. You need to get through the shock, the denial, the frustration, the anger, the depression very, very fast because we have to act. We either need to move left or right, and we need to do so after this webinar. I like to work with absolute truths. And if you think about it, they're very, very few. In fact, the world is more gray than black and white. That's an important fact in, 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 in this instance, because you know, when I work with people, I recognize 
that the way I see things might not be the way they see things. And for those of us who become too principled around anything and everything, we're simply shooting ourselves in the foot because we are not demonstrating an empathy sufficient to get the business done when you work with someone who sees things differently from you. And when you look at it from that point of view, you suddenly realize that in fact there's more gray than black and white, but there are absolute truths that are black and white. Let's work with those. And the purpose behind this is to move through that Kubler-Ross process very quickly. Fact, truth, you're born. Fact, truth, <laughs> you will die. We're all born to die. Hopefully it won't be from Corona if we're smart, but you will die. That's an absolute truth. Next absolute truth, you cannot change another person. Only they can change themselves. Yes, you can persuade, you can encourage, you can threaten, you can bribe, you can uh, charm, you can do whatever it might be. But until somebody decides to change, they themselves won't. Think about that within the context of the Kubler-Ross curve. We have always lived in a world of great uncertainty. It feels far more uncertain now than ever before, but it's simply because we're getting access to a lot of information. And I'd like to just pause on that for a minute. Be careful around what you choose to read, because if you read the rubbish that's out there and you don't resource yourself with proper information and knowledge, you will immediately find yourself regressing back up that Kubler-Ross curve. Of a day things are working, of a day you think you have a view, of a day you're going to act in this direction, someone sends you some crappy piece of social media, they claim it to be truthful and from a good resource, it even looks like it's from a good resource, and bang, you read it, and you're right back at shock, denial, frustration, depression. There is no time for it. I'm calling those pity parties. There is no time for it. Please be careful what you read. Next, Carl Jung, a very, very well-versed psychologist, quoted this. He said, the is is sacred. The one thing that I do know in a battleground is that when you're in that ring and you're getting punched in the face, thinking, I should have trained harder, I would have done this, they should have done that. We ought to have had this. If only, none of it works. None of it works. You've got to make yourself at this point in time very, very present. And the best way to do that is going to be through action. If you make yourself very present, you yourself will see things for what they are. And you will do so within the context of what you have control over. In my view, the only thing we're spending any time and attention on is what you have 100% control over. And guys, that's the way you choose to look at things, an attitude. Only you can decide which attitude is gonna be the right attitude for you, given your circumstances and given your own personal psychology. And here's why it's so important. An attitude leads to the way you behave and act. It leads to the things that you say. It leads to the things that you do. Those are the things that give you the result of your life. Whether it be in relationships, whether it be in your business, whether it be in how you're going to deal with your suppliers, whether it be in how you deal with your staff and how you deal with your customers, how you deal with the bank, how you deal with the landlord and how you deal with your family, how you deal with each other as business partners if you're in a partnership. It's gonna be the attitude that guides all of that. And if the result you're getting is not working, you have to change your attitude to the thing before you decide to change the thing itself. So why do you do what you do? I am now gonna to attempt to try and persuade you that there is only one attitude over here for us as business owners. I'm gonna use the analogy of a ship. And the reason analogies are good is because it gives a little bit of distance. It depersonalizes and takes down the emotion in terms of the relationship you have with your business. My argument is that as business owners, we have one objective, and that is to build our businesses into an asset of value. So let's look at that from the perspective of a ship. When you sail a ship, 
it's really no different to building a business. This is why. Firstly, we all departed from somewhere. And most importantly, what will lead to our success in our seafaring journey is the extent to which we understand where we are sailing to. If we have clarity on what that direction is and what it looks like, and to the extent that we can define it and give it shape and criteria, it helps us maintain our heads in a massively wild storm that we're gonna be sailing through. When you decide to change your direction and you're saying, I'm no longer sailing to Mumbai, I'm gonna to sail to Hong Kong, the risks that you take are enormous because it means you haven't resourced the business, nor prepared the ship, nor prepared your team for that journey itself. We need to start today with committing to what is the destination that we expect in the businesses we're building. Next, without a crew, there is no hope. There is no hope. I, I was in the Navy, I was in the Navy for Marine Navy for three years. I remember there was a period when I was 150 miles due south from Cape Hogalis. It's on its way to Antarctica. And we were hitting massive, massive storms. The waves were 12 to 18 meters in height. And it was, there's a French word, sounds like ducking, but I think it might begin with an F. It was terrifying. Honestly, the only reason we survived is for two things. Number one, the hull of the ship was built to withstand it. But more importantly, the hull was being contained and controlled by a crew, a bunch of people who knew what to do, how to do, and when to do it. It's our jobs as the captains of our ships to really give leadership to our staff at this point in time. The next thing is you need to decide where will you be spending your time? The engine room is below decks. It prevents you from seeing the environment you're in. It's head down, and I'm just simply gonna get busy and do what I need to do to survive. It's putting our fires mode. When you're in the engine room, your job is to keep the engine turning. It makes the propeller turn and it gives you momentum. But if you're on the bridge, it gives you control. And it gives you control in that you can see what's out there. You have instrumentation that tells you whether there's a storm ahead or a wave ahead. And then it gives you the option to move around it or to go through it and prepare your boat and your crew for it. It's my belief that most of us need to migrate at least 60, 70% of our time to the bridge. I think that the storm we're about to go through is going to require us to spend a lot more time in the engine room with our team, leading from the front and by way of example, rather than being up on the bridge. If you don't navigate and you don't resource for this, you will land up out at sea with no more food, fuel and water. Finally, destination, asset of value. Let's talk quickly around what that looks like. That's it. The lighthouse we're sailing to, it's a business that is built and has a brand to it. It means that you know who your clients are, you know what problem you're solving for them, and you know the experience they want in having that problem solved. I urge you, I urge you, don't try now through a panic response, become everything to everybody because you will find yourself becoming nothing to anybody. We face a wonderful opportunity as business owners here. The circumstances of everyone's life is changing. And as they change, the problems they experience will change alongside with it. If you know who you serve and you have the opportunity to understand it profoundly, it means you can craft your value propositions, your offers, your pricing models, your delivery models, your engagement models to give the experience that that customer group or client group need in order to still support you through this period. It's a business that's built on systems. I'll talk to that a bit later. Because it's systems that allow you to capacitate your crew. When you're on a ship and you work above decks, it's very clear what you need to do when the alarm sounds. When you work in the engine room, it's crystal clear what you need to do when the alarm sounds. Ships, really in truth, are just 10,000 checklists. And everyone has their checklist. 
And they know when that light goes from green to red, you look at the checklist and you follow what it says you need to do. It's a business that needs to be fundable. And in a time where everyone's going to be reticent to fund, and it's going to be hard to find finance, I promise you there's money out there looking for good businesses demonstrated through good leadership. And finally, Corona will come and go. The storm we're about to hit and the one that we're in will pass. The end objective for us is to build a business that can be sold. Because for all of us, it's highly likely in the next six months, we're going to be paying back into the business. We ourselves are going to have to fund the business. We're going to have to fund the delivery of our services, our staff, our suppliers. We need to actually keep alive because they who live at the end of the storm will be the last people standing. And there will be massive dividends that lie behind that. So, as I said to you, I'm a, what I'm going to share with you now is an introductory overview. This will be the first of many, many webinars. The reason I'm cautious around saying this, and the reason that I'm spending time just emphasizing this, the future webinars will be very specific and very direct. This overview is a perspective for any business owner to adopt five tactics. The way you might deploy it and the way you might deploy it will be fundamentally different, and it should be, because everyone has different circumstances. One of the areas that I will be doubling down on is a horrible classification for us all. I'm calling it the good, bad, and ugly. There are certain businesses that really fall into the ugly space. If you're in eventing, if you're in hospitality, if you're in what I call the social economy, you're going to take tremendous strain over this period. There are some businesses that will absolutely thrive in this. If you're in the sanitizer business or medical services or medical couriers, if you're in the food or staples environment, you will most likely thrive for so long as it's not retail entertainment. And most of us, most of us by far, I think are going to be in, man, whatever it takes, we need to just live through the storm and sustain to the other side. It'll be very moderated and dampened. But if we make the right moves, it might well mean that we do survive it. So the strategies I'm going to be sharing with you apply differently to all of these. But because this is the first webinar, I really want to give the principles of actions rather than the direct actions themselves. And I hope you understand this. So a five-step Corona business battle plan. Objective, to be the last man standing. Objective, to be alive at the end of the storm. We're going to talk about how to get money in, how to reduce money out, importantly, how to optimize your business. The engines have to work smoothly, and we're going to have time on our side. We're going to talk about how to manage your crew. There are going to be some tough discussions had with staff. I have no, no doubt about that at all. And how you have those discussions and the right way to have them so that you can sustain your business to live through to the other side is going to be important. And then we're going to talk about how you invest your time. Many of us will be working from home, perhaps, or in certainly uh, number down office environments, or whatever the case might be. Business is going to slow down a lot. Once we have done one, two, three, and four, if you've done them right, you should be able to craft some time to get a perspective on what you will be doing post the corona economy. So let's talk immediately getting money in. The first part of getting money in, you've got to hold on to your clients, increase sales, and build new clients. And that sounds crazy. <laughs> when nobody wants to perhaps spend and everyone's feeling nervous to spend and people are going through the Kubler-Ross process, how are we going to do this? So first thing, hold on to current clients. And I'll give you a few examples of certainly what I'm seeing. If you are a business that has stock and you supply stock to your clients, what I can tell you is that the global supply chains have come to a grinding halt. If you think about it, the two big factories of the world 
maybe three, you could argue, but the two main factories of the world responsible for at least 60% of all production are China and Germany. China's factories shut down. They're only now going back to work. And once they go back to work, all the small businesses that supplied them in order to create the components, the products, the uh, items that you acquire, that you buy, they're going to take time to kickstart. Once they do, the distribution chains themselves are going to take time to kickstart. Shipping lines have halted. Containers have frozen. That whole process is a six-week process before stock from China starts arriving in a moderate fashion, enough to fill up your stores. Germany, I think, is going to go through a 12-week slowdown. If you are buying anything from Germany, from Italy, from Europe, you can expect a 12-week period where it's unlikely you're going to be getting any stock into your stores. So the opportunity here is to speak to your customers and do so in a manner where you speak to your most loyal customers first. Let them be aware that your ability to supply in the short to medium term is going to be compromised. And let them be in a position where they can place orders with you in order to safeguard and protect their businesses. It's a very good way to build loyalty and it's a very good way to get money in. At the same time, and guys, I'm sorry, I have to talk from the perspective of a business, the asset of value. And I talk with that voice. And as an asset of value, as how we have described it and what we intend to do, I'm going to talk from that perspective. So at the same time, look carefully at who your competitors are. See whether they are able to supply and service their clients. And to the extent that they can't, it's a real opportunity for you to now reach out to their customers and clients and get them on board. You have to build different value propositions. I can assure you that the way you sold your service or products, whatever it may be, and the way you positioned your offerings to your clients six weeks ago, arguing why they should buy from you, how you solve the problem for them and what value they can enjoy from you, that set of circumstances has changed definitively. You need to now get into a position where in working with your customers, you can understand what new problems they're going to face, understand how they need those problems solved, and in doing what you do, find the languaging to capacitate your sales team to use that languaging and resonate with that new reality. Because I say it again, if you don't recognize the felt need of whoever it is you're serving in the moment that you engage with them, the likelihood that they will see here and therefore support and trust you is very, very low. A good example in the restaurant trade, one of our clients is a restaurant that does about 280 million rand a year, and they do so through 12 various footprints. And I was speaking to the business owner the day before yesterday, they had come to an absolute grinding halt. And the proposition I put to him was this. If you think about what the corona economy problem set is, many of us will now be working from home. We might well have kids at home, for those who do. And we might as well have to also take care of parents, elderly, frail parents, who are at severe risk in the corona economy. My suggestion to him was why doesn't he consider putting together food packs that allow you to, in one instance, you either collect or you deliver to a family of four and provide them with the food that they require over that week. And for elderly parents to, a household of two, do so in the same way. It supports social isolation or social distancing. It prepares us for if we have to go into isolation. And secondly, it's not a way to make money because you're going to be offering at a price cheaper than the retailers are doing it. It's a service. And it's a service to your potential clients and customers that will secure them through loyalty to come back to you when things settle again. Importantly, it's a service that keeps the wolves from the door because you have to maintain your premises. You have to, to a large degree, maintain your staff. You've got to try and maintain your suppliers. And that's how you survive this. You won't make the returns that you wanted as you would typically in your everyday business, but you will live to fight another day. Another example is selling to new clients. 
I've already mentioned that in my previous example. Build the sales scripts, train your staff to the extent that you can't get new clients, to the extent that you competitors are able to service them. Then it's a really good time to get your sales staff to focus on building lists. And what I mean by that is if, for example, you are a business that supplies plants into offices and you've only ever done so into the banking sector, it's a really good time now to draw up a list of all the insurance companies out there, understand who the facilities managers are, and prepare that database for when we have gotten through the corona economy, you have a completely new list of clients that you can start marketing and selling to. If you think about it, very seldom do we have an opportunity to pause for a minute, think about who the new markets are that we could serve in doing what we do, and build a proper campaign to reach those new markets. If business is slow, which I expect it to be for most of us, it's a good way to make your staff productive in this instance. Another thing is stick to your knitting. Don't get panicked and don't get distracted. Because the moment everyone starts to make hand sanitizer, it means that hand sanitizer is going to be bought on one thing only, and that's price. And when you start fighting in the pricing commodity space, especially in an area where you have no experience of supply chain, distribution chains, you don't have experience of the product, the labeling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You land up becoming everything to anyone. And at the end of it, you're nothing to everyone. The idea here, stick to your knitting, double down, be expert in your area of expertise, domain, and knowledge. Your competitors are gonna be panicking, I promise you, Capitalize on that at least, but do so in a manner that keeps you alive at the end of this so that you can dominate when things settle. Meet customers, meet them. You know, very often you don't have time to go and meet them and they don't have time to see you. It's a perfect time to have quality conversations. Become adept at using Zoom, at using screens the way we are today and have conversations. Empathize with people. Behind every single customer is a human being. And that human being has a world of trouble in their own. And it differs from person to person to person. This is an ideal time to reach out and empathize with people in order to have a quality conversation. It is a perfect time to build relationships. It's not necessarily a good time when you can see there is no opportunity to try and impose a sale. This is thinking now that will help you build a relationship for after the event. It also gives you really deep insight into how businesses and consumers are behaving. And through that, it aids you in building new sales scripts and building new value propositions. Generate cash from your suppliers. So we work, one of my clients has got an enormous facility. They do weddings and conferences. Can you imagine weddings and conferences? Their business has literally shut down. And in the instance, what they turn around and said is we have managed, they're one of the few, to have built up a small capital reserve. We've always had to do so because we're a seasonal business, so we have good practice for it. We were going into the winter period in any event, so the winter reserves that we have built over the summer period, I'm now going to use to build a two and a half megawatt power plant, independently of Eskom, because the pain Eskom has caused my business has been profound. He is now engaged with people who can provide that for him. Their initial costs, which were a big lump sum up front with the service fee that follows on afterwards, the way he did the deal with them is I'll pay you monthly for an extended period of time, but I need to hold on to my cash. That way they secure a long-term relationship with him. And this way he gears his business to cope with any downturns that might be expected as a result of Eskim. If some of you are up against a very, very tough wall and you've got assets in your business, it might be vehicles that you own, it might be pieces of plant and equipment that you own. When you're at the edge of a battle, and survival is the only strategy. 
there will be an opportunity for you to speak to certain financiers where they acquire your assets back from you and lease them to you over a period of time. If it's done right, that brings in a bullet payment of cash and it lessens your monthly overheads. In the sense that, I beg your pardon, it doesn't lessen your monthly overheads, but it spreads, the, it spreads your cost of owning that asset over the months. If you bring in enough cash, and that is enough to actually survive you for the next three to six months, then you've achieved what you set out to do, to be one of the last men standing. I promise you, if you are one of the last people standing, the business that you're in will boom, and through that process, you accumulate your cash reserves again and acquire your assets back. It's a temporary strategy, and it's available only to those that have asset-based businesses. Do offers. Guys, get creative. You know, it's a new normal. Out of the, an out-of-the-box economy needs an out-of-the-box thinking. We have, we have clients in a number of different areas. One of them makes really amazing kitchens. And the kitchen business has come to a grinding halt. The other does residential landscaping, but in A income environments. And they do really well. They've got a service that runs and they maintain the, the gardens that they build. We put them together and facilitated a conversation between the two of them. And this is what they came up with. They turned on and said, look, maybe we can combine forces. One of the biggest growth trends in the United States are what, we, are, are what are referred to as outdoor kitchens. It's more than just a braai area. It's an entertainment area. It's where you have your fire, you have hot tubs, you have TV screens, you have lounge suites, and it's done in a very, very congenial, engaging environment. In a world of social distancing, where people will be spending more and more and more time at home, where people will have their kids living on top of them 24 seven, where husbands and wives or partners in whatever shape or form they might be, have to live with each other 24 seven. The idea of having an outdoor space, which is a safe space as a reprieve is very appealing. They together have created a joint value proposition, this offering, and together they are deploying their marketing teams to jointly market this. Inventive thinking in circumstances that have lent themselves to it, which had we not had the corona economy happen upon us, they would never have done. Next, reduce money out. The strategy here is to keep your suppliers, reduce your costs, and share risks wherever possible. So speak to your landlord. Here's my view on how we should be speaking to landlords. All of us work from either warehouses, offices, factories, retail stores. The reality is, if we go out of business, they will not fill that space for the next three years. The reason for it is that our reserves in the SME world have been completely corroded by the factors I mentioned earlier. Crappy economic policy and shocking, shocking outcomes from ESCOM. We've all taken pain for it. If we go down, the space that we occupy will remain unlet. This is how you negotiate with your landlord. Argue that you want a 12% reduction in your rent. Moving up to 24%, moving up to 36% in relationship to the infection rate of Corona in South Africa. What that means is as the infection rate grows, the risk of a strategy that says isolation is the country's next step means that your discount on rent increases dramatically to 36%. And as we level out and it comes back down and we move to a new normal again, where the infection rates are moderated, your rental rates increase. That's how you do the deal with the commitment that over the six months that this applies, you will extend your lease by six months at the end of your term. It's called a win-win on both sides. I think you need to ask for it and move towards a situation where you insist on it. Variabilize your costs wherever possible. 
And this is where the toughest, toughest conversations will take place for some of us. We will have to speak to our staff. We might well have to go from a five-day week to a three-day week, from a three-day week to a one-day week. It's going to depend on whether you're in the good, bad, or ugly bucket. I can promise you, your staff are terrified. Very few people in this country have options. Very, very few people. It's going to be important that you lead in this process. They might take three days off. It means that you're working seven days. And during that period, you need to give assurances that this is simply a survival strategy. That's certainly how I would speak to my key staff, my industrious staff, the people who are actually putting a foot forward and helping the business survive through this terrible period. You don't want to lose staff, and I'll tell you why. When we get over this, and there's no telling when that will be, in order to get your business going again and to capitalize aggressively on the fact that you're one of the last men standing in your area of expertise and domain, you need your staff to be present, up, and at it because you're going to hit sales hard and fast. You want to capitalize on the fact that you got through this and when the demand chain starts knocking on your door saying, we need service, we need product, you'll start to understand how to make that happen fast. If you're speaking with people who, for example, a lot of companies have got marketing agencies working with them. If they've got a retainer service with you, the time has now come to turn around and say, the retainer will be reduced by 50% and I will give you 100% payment over and above that based on leads that you help us bring in, or on measurable income generating performance. Partners, I'm working with, we're working with a, a business that's got five partners. The oldest partner I think is 72, the youngest partner is 45. The oldest partner turned around and said, I can't take this punch. <laughs> and he says, Pablo, you know, in building this business, it's a 200 and 20 odd million rand a year business. He says the number of punches that I have gotten up off the floor again to fight again. At 72, I think I've done my time. And what they asked me to do is help them negotiate a management buyout, a valuation on the business over a three year term that would immediately see the remaining partners acquire the shares of the older partner, whilst at the same time stopping the salary of the older partner to take the pain out of the business during the corona economy. Speak, and speak honestly with your partners. Some of you might be up for the battle, some of you might not be up for the battle. Here's the reality. It needs to all be done in service of the business surviving. Because if the business doesn't survive, any conversation with any partner is futile. Okay, let me talk. Strategy three, optimizing the engines. What are the engines? As I mentioned in the ship analogy, the engines are what keep the propeller turning. In your business, your engines are made up of business systems. There are six or seven of them. The first is your marketing system. Only thing it should do, generate leads. Your sales engine or system should convert the leads. Your operation system should service those leads. Once you've got customers on board, deliver the thing, provide the service, and do so in a manner that keeps them coming back. Your procurement systems should make sure you're buying right. People systems, you want the right people doing the right thing at the right time and at the right price. And what I mean by the right price, in a business as normal event, five days working weeks, typically see your salaries been paid. If you're moving to a three-day working week, there need to be adjustments. Finally, it's about money systems. Your job as the business owner is to make sure there's enough oxygen in this body so that as we move through this marathon, it finishes the marathon alive. How do you do this? What you're gonna be doing with your teams is in marketing, in sales, in ops, in procurement, and in many systems, 
you're going to map out all the activities that make these activities themselves take place. You're going to see how you can simplify and improve them. So for example, how do you build a marketing campaign? Do you build marketing campaigns? You should be, and you should be thinking about what they need to be now in the Corona economy and what they could look like post the Corona economy, because getting that work done now is ideal. It gives everybody purpose and meaning. And most importantly, I'm going back to the Kubler-Ross theory. It keeps us in action. Because when you're not busy and you're not acting, that's when you become susceptible to the relentless bad news that is out there and will continue to play out. And the moment you become susceptible to that, you're not managing yourself because you're going to go right back up to the depression stage. Simpler systems are better. Simpler systems are teachable. Simpler systems are scalable. It's a really good time to sit back and reflect who in your business is not playing game. And what I mean by this is the following. If you are unsure how any part of your business works, in marketing, in sales, in ops, in procurement, in people management, and in money management, and you think that you have one key or two key individuals, and you define them as key individuals because they simply get the thing done, but you're not entirely sure how. It's those individuals that you have to work with more deliberately to map out how they do what they do. Because understand this, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's the tension of the relationship. They are behaving in that way because they want to be indispensable to the business. They want to be indispensable to the business because they are fearful that if they show how things work, it might mean that someone at a lower salary could perhaps do what they do. As a business owner, and speaking from an asset of value perspective, you cannot afford to be held over the barrel by anybody. It's a good time now to work with your team. People are going to be more engaging in your organization as they will be in the marketplace and as they will be in supplier bases than ever before. A key, key person is a risk to the future of your business, and it is a profound risk to the sell, the sell and exit of your business, your business. If I'm valuing your business and I see key people in that business, I'm going to compromise the valuation because the business is susceptible to them. Think about it from that point of view. It's very hard to do when engines are spinning at full speed, when we are busy as all hell. It's not hard to do this work and it's important work to do when you have the time to do it. Capacitate your crew. Keep your industrious, committed staff. People are expecting change. I've already spoken about it. Remodel your business. Really, in the way that you have built your business, in the way that you've organized your team, is it optimized? Or have you been intending to optimize it further? And have you not gotten, it, gotten to it because you have just been generally so busy every day? With time on your hands now, take some perspective. Narrow and niche. Seek to specialize in whatever it is you do. Don't seek to generalize. Generalized business models are very, very expensive and extremely unprofitable. Generalized business models seldom make for a good exit for you five, 10, 15 years from now. In sales, we've spoken about it. Get them selling. They should be on the phone. They should be working across screens. Every day, there's no time for people to pay, play Candy Crush and mess around. If they say to you the market's not responding, get them building databases for future markets you want to tackle. Get them to design campaigns. Get the languaging right, get the design right. Think about how you're going to get campaigns out to future markets. Will it be social media? Will it be through events? How would you do your stands in future? Will it be through direct selling? How will that work? Think it through. Think it through in detail. 
this is the time to do the planning for post-corona economy. In operations, get them to innovate. Are there any areas that you can improve how your service is delivered or how your product is delivered? Here's a silly example. If you've been using plastic packaging, now's the time to explore paper packaging instead. And there are two reasons for it. The coronavirus does not last as long on paper packaging as it does on plastic packaging. But the real reason behind this is I promise you there is a storm of legislation coming down the pipe in the next three years around environment and, environment and climate change. Plastic is going to be increasingly banned. And for those who use it, you will be pissing off customers and consumers. It will act against you. So think where you can, for example, change plastic packaging into paper packaging. Do it now because you've got your team on board and you've got the time to do it. In the same way, all the processes that I spoke about earlier, activities in a sequence that can be measured and can be taught, that's what a business system is. Map them out. Because now's the time to say, of those processes, where can I bring technology in to deliver them? How do I digitize them? And I'm doing so in a manner that when I can take advantage of being the last man standing, my cost of service is lower because I'm going to dominate the market, not by raising my prices, but by dropping my prices and capturing more clients. Technology is crucial in getting the gears to work neatly together. If you think about where most things stand in a business, it's where your marketing gear doesn't connect properly with the selling gear, which then doesn't connect properly with your service and your operational fulfillment gear, which doesn't connect properly with the people gear and the money gear. This is a really good time to understand each of those systems, see how to make them work in a more integrated, orchestrated way, and start exploring, because you will have time to do it, what technology you can use to support that. In administration, Get your admin team to focus on getting the money in and get them to focus on where you can variableize costs in the next short term. They themselves need to look at how they can become far more effective and far more efficient. It's a really good time to explore different pricing models at the moment in the services that you offer. Invest your time. I've spoken about how to do that. Really. It's the most precious commodity we have. And here's the reality. In a normalized environment, we never have enough of it to do the things we need to do to improve the capability of our businesses. A changing environment creates different problem sets. Use this as an opportunity to learn and understand. You need to think, new positioning. The problems I solve today for these types of clients who else has these types of problems that I could solve tomorrow? It's a really good time to think about your business in those terms. And when you make the decision of who else it is, just be clear that you're making the decision in a manner that won't require you to reinvent the underlying operations of your business. Because that then is a bad strategy. That then is a strategy that says, oh my God, I need to do whatever I possibly can. I'm going to try and be everything to everyone. And the complexity you build in the business is eventually what erodes all your profitability and value. Think of a new operating model. So I can tell you for free on our side, we have in every quarter around 6,000 face-to-face sessions with clients right around the world. We have them in meeting rooms. From Wednesday next week, it'll all be digitized across screens. So what does it mean for us? It means that we've had to train our team how to create a really good screen-based experience. It means for us that next week, we will be training all our clients how to have a really good screen-based engagement with us in return. 
And through that, we're sharing the training with them so they can learn how to train their clients and customers and suppliers and staff how to have really good engagements across screens. It's a new operating model. We were always moving in that direction. But on Sunday night, we got a punch in the face so hard that we have taken what we intended to do over six months and done it in a week. We all have to act, look for new markets, identify new processes, and most valuably, build new relationships. You do not need to be in this on your own. In fact, it's daft to be in this on your own. Here's why. <laughs> if you stay in your own little world and you don't reach out and engage, and you don't form the right relationships, I promise you, you start to believe that it's personal, that you're the only one suffering. To the extent that you hear of others who are going through equal pain, and through the extent that you can voice it out loud and express it and draw different perspectives, through that, that's where the crack of light appears. People who know this better than you and I are everyone who's in drug rehabilitation, Alcoholic Anonymous, those strategies are so well thought out and played out, and they've been proven to work again and again and again. In crisis, don't isolate yourself. In crisis, you reach out and embrace others. Think about after the corona economy. That's where we're heading. So last man standing. At the end of the cycle, you want to be surviving. You want to be the last man standing. If you do it right, you'll build your brand. Let me give an example. If you're gonna be a real ass, and you're in the hand sanitizer business, and you normally sell it for 43 Rand, and now you hike it up to 83 Rand, you will do well in the next three months, six months, really well. At the moment we return back to normal, you will be remembered by your clients how you behaved and how you capitalized on people's vulnerability. An asset of value says, we're always thinking about tomorrow, but we're acting today. Use the opportunity to build your reputation. Step out and step beyond. If you do something remarkable, trumpet it into the social media environment. Everybody's looking for heroes. And now is the time that we as business owners have to lead. If we expect in government to do so, they will do so within their domain, but it will never be enough for us in terms of what we need. If we expect in corporates to do so, then I'm going back to there is a sacred. It's a blame mentality if you yourself don't do it. It's not personal. Ladies and gentlemen, Going back to the analogy of a ship, our ships are different indeed. They've got different purposes and different functions. Our crews are different. Some have bigger ships, some have smaller ships. Some are using wind power, some are using petrol power. But we are all sailing in the same sea. It's not personal. Some will gain, a lot of people are gonna be hurt. Here's my thing, if you do thrive, and if you face these challenges and you take them on well, and in fact, you have the opportunity to do really well in this environment, please do so with profound empathy. If you are in pain and you're going to go into more pain, recognize that even though you might be feeling panicked and you might feel that you're on the edge of losing everything, there are many, many other people in that space. Leadership for us now as business owners really comes through in the way that we behave. The reason I'm doing this is because I am beyond worried around the SME segment in this country. We've never ever had proper help. We can't expect it now. I don't think we're gonna find people stepping up to the plate. So we have to lead ourselves. 
Why are we doing this? We're in your corner. I'm in your corner. Given what we've been through, given what we do as a business, this is our area of expertise, building businesses, understanding business growth, understanding how to resolve business challenges is what we do. It would be profoundly unfair, in my view, to not make the information we have available, the insight we have available, the opportunity we have, given what we've done and what we do, to not share it broadly and widely. The SME economy needs to create its own tribe. We are, I promise you, mostly on our own. It's business owners like us who have the empathy for each other rather than anybody else. It's business owners like us that have the opportunity to be really inventive and smart about how we traverse the challenges we face. It's my view that we should be sharing that openly with each other. If we don't build the SME economy and the SME economy gets hurt in this process, what it means is that our economy will become again dominated by corporates. And there are very, very few SMEs I know who are treated righteously, fairly, and sensibly by corporates. We're not going to get that treatment from government. We, <laughs> we're on our own, guys. We're gonna to stick together, okay. So what am I gonna be doing? Weekly from next week, I'm going to have a public webinar. Um, anyone and everyone is welcome to join it. I will not hold punches. I will speak very plainly and directly. I'm going to draw on all the insights that we are being shared through our clients, what we're seeing working, what we're seeing is not working. I do so with their permission already. I'm going to be responding to all the questions that you might have. Because I've no doubt that there are businesses out there that have very specific issues that they need to contend with and challenge. We're going to be talking about strategies to contain costs. We'll be talking about how to collectively work with our landlords, collectively work with our banks, collectively work with our telecommunication providers. It's my personal view that they need to step up to the plate because they are in the industries that they're in and they have the balance sheets that they have because they largely live in very protected economies based on the history of this country. They need to step up to the party and help us survive this period. So I'll be talking a lot around how you get that done sensibly and how we might get it done as an enormous collective working together. We don't have to be on our own. I want to talk about how to grow revenues in this, in this environment. Certainly what I'm seeing out there, what works and what doesn't work. You know, often when you talk about what one business is doing, it sparks in your mind what you could perhaps do in your own business. I'm gonna talk a lot about technology. Mm. Now's the time for us to step ahead. The bridge has been burnt. There is no going back to the week before last. Now's the time to accelerate all our digitization, automation, mechanization strategies. Let's at least understand what it means and where it could apply so that we could invest in it after the corona economy. Um, I mentioned government and corporate. I'm going to be talking a lot about housekeeping. By housekeeping, I'll go back to mindset. It's about how to keep your mind tidy. Clarity, conciseness, confidence. That's how you lead. You do so from the front and you set the example for everyone in your team. And then I'm going to be talking about a lot of sector and industry specific challenges that have been faced. I've reached out to all the trade associations and I've reached out to a number of uh, people who are experts in very particular sectors and industries. And where we need to draw their expertise and where we need to call on them to help guide us and give us some new ideas and insights, I'm going to do so. By that, I also mean having reached out to those same sectors and industries in the US, in the UK, and in the EU, because perspectives from completely different environments are often valuable. The way that I'll be communicating with you post this webinar is I'll be sending out a note to everyone who is on board, who joined and visited the webinar. Um, I'm gonna be asking you for your help. Please let me know how we can do this better. I want to make this a public resource. If you think it's gonna be valuable, 
invite your customers, invite your staff if you have to, but it is very specifically centered around business owners and business owner thinking, and invite your suppliers, because if they can find access to information that helps them improve, they're gonna improve your supplier opportunity. And if customers can improve their performance, they're gonna improve your sales opportunity. Let's make this a tribal effort for SMEs, and let's make it open to anyone and everyone who wants to be part of it. I really do hope that this has been helpful. I hope it's been useful. I will send out an email. I really, really look forward to your responses. Um, this is in service to you, and through that, trust me, it's in service back to you, because it's where I personally get my meaning and purpose in life from. I'm not getting emotional on it. I'm ending it over there. And thank you guys for joining. Um, I'll see you, those who want to be involved next week, and bring along friends and family. You take care.